Today's May 12th, 2014. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer for the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer at the History Center, and Josh Hogan, who is an archivist working with the History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Jack Walters. Mr. Walters is a veteran of World War II, and he has kindly agreed to come in and share his, his life experiences and his military experiences with us. This is in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and Mr. Walters' story will be recorded and put on file with the Library of Congress. Mr. Walters, we really appreciate you coming in here today and I look forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Could you give us your full name and current address, please? My uh, name is Jack Lurlin Walters, L-U-R-L-Y-N, in case you've never heard of that word before. And I uh, re presently reside in Marietta, Georgia. Where and when were you born? September the 20th, 19 and 27. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I, grew, I was born in Benton, Kansas, which is uh, about uh, 20 miles outside of the city of Wichita, Kansas. And, on, and uh, my father worked for the Missouri Pacific Railroad he was a telegraph operator, and uh, he was there. He went to World War One, and then when he returned, why uh, he bid in uh, Yates Center, Kansas, which is another 60 or 80 miles east of uh, Wichita, and uh, so uh, so we lived there. That's where I grew up, and uh, we lived in a country house and on on the highway 51, I think it was. And uh, we had a barn and cows and horses and chickens and uh, that we raised there. And uh, and uh, it was a hay center of the world, Yates Center, Kansas is. <laughs> and during the summer times, you used to hay as a young boy and work in the hay fields and do that kind of work. And well, I went to an old country school. I rode a horse to school. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that was... Uh, uh, we had a little barn there where that you, you got to school. You watered your horse and put the hay down for it for the, and uh, then you go in and See. go to school. And it was about two students per each grade. Two? Yeah. Huh. Uh, first through the sixth, I think it was wow. in that period, and uh, all farm kids and all. Um, I was the only one that my dad worked for a railroad telegraph. He was a railroad telegraph driver, and, and he worked for the Missouri Pacific, and he was the only one that had a regular job. And uh, it was during the Depression yeah. period and all that kind of stuff as I grew up. Time for tough. Yeah. Uh, had uh, grasshopper infestations and all kinds of summer droughts and that kind of things and during that period of time that was uh, people were on the road going to, losing their farms and and moving west huh. the whole world seemed to be moving west when we were it seemed like because yeah. half of them stopped at our farmhouse for, can you help us get down the road <laughs> right. and uh, huh. so that was quite common in that period of time so uh, life was uh, Pretty tough for uh, most people. Uh, we were uh, kind of an exception. Uh, we had uh, a job, my dad, and so our life was a little like a little less harsh, harsh than a lot of the farm folks. You go to school and all the kids smell like skunk or, yeah. or some kind of an animal that they'd hunted that morning before they came to school. Wow! Except for the girls, of course. Yeah. And. Uh, that's basically a lot of my growing up. And when I, <clears throat> I went into the uh, junior high year, we went to, to town and uh, we get to school, to grade school. We went to the, uh, I think it was seventh, eighth, and then in high school, the, night, the three years of the high school. But I, uh, about that time, World War I, I mean, two broke out. And... Uh, my uh, brother had uh, osteomyelitis of the leg. That's a very serious bone disease, and he uh, cost a lot of money for him to get well again. So uh, 
my folks were in debt quite heavily. And so uh, during that period of time, I, uh, my mother decided to go to World War, go to work for a beach aircraft company in Wichita. Huh. So she picked up us kids and we went to Wichita. And Dad stayed there as a telegraph operator because his job was frozen during the war. Yeah. And so uh, we lived in, well, I got ornery during that period of time and <laughs> went to school in John Marshall grade school and then in the North High University, uh, High School. And in my sophomore year, I, I skipped school a lot and got in a lot of trouble and stuff like that. And, and so my mother sent me home to live with my dad because she couldn't handle me, keep me under control. And I didn't do any better there at the Yates Center. <laughs> that's, that's the year I wanted to go to war and save the country from the evil Jap yeah. Japanese. Yeah. And uh, so uh, my dad finally resented, I, I said, okay, when you get 17 and a half, you can go. So, uh, when I was we got 17 and a half, I, I went down and joined the Navy, and he signed the papers. And uh, then uh, they sent me to Kansas City for uh, physical, uh, physical, I think it was, and and uh, they even sent I, the dentist. They sent me home and said I had to have my teeth fixed. Huh. Well, I, I my poor old dad had spent two hundred dollars to fix my teeth. <laughs> And then we went into the, went, I went back to and reported to the boot camp, got in boot camp. And when I got there, uh, a few days later after I got there, they sent me down to the dentist and he pulled all that, boot, all that stuff out and replaced it. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Didn't make any sense to me, but that's what they did. Anyhow, boot camp was kind of a uh, interesting place. The uh, first time I was on, I had a, per, Form a watch. I remember, I was signed to the to the the uh, drying room of the wash room where they dry, put your clothes. You wash your own hand clothes and diapers. I mean your uh, underwear and stuff, and hung them up in the. And I had to stand there and for three or four hours or whatever the watch was and watch clothes dry. And I couldn't <laughs> believe I joined the Navy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not the most exciting assignment. It <laughs> sure wasn't. Anyhow, uh, then uh, the uh, another odd thing was that the guy up on the bunk above me was named the same name as I had, Jack L. Walters. The and, same name? Yeah, same name. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting and, <laughs> and confusing to the chief. And... Uh, because we both did, and we'd always answer the same day, at the same time, that the, whenever we were called. Anyhow, uh, that was a period of time. Let's and this see. was 1945, right? 1945, yeah. And uh, then, let's see what happened. Uh, what, Luke, oh, what, I got, uh, oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Why did you decide to join the Navy as opposed to another branch of the service? Uh, I really had no knowledge of why I did it. I was... Uh, I just thought they'd take me overseas and, yeah. and I'd see a little of the world and that's yeah. basically why I joined okay. the Navy. I didn't know anything about yeah. what I was doing actually. Yeah. I just wanted to get away from home, okay. I think, okay. during that period of time. But that's probably why I did it, Yeah. travel. Let's see, where was I at? Uh, well, you talked about your assignment when you were watching the clothes dry yeah. and you had your your bunk mate who had the same name. Yeah, and then uh, we walk, they uh, get called out some infraction of the chief, take us out in the middle of the night and on the grinder with our full pack on our backs and squat, and squat down and duck walk for a, <laughs> a, a, several minutes and be exhausted when he got finished. And everybody wanted to throw that chief out the window, <laughs> but they didn't do it. Uh, let's see, where was that? Uh, next thing, uh, we moved uh, uh, from there. We, I recall I got called in for not writing home. I never wrote a ho letter in my life, and uh, you had to write home to your mother all the time, and they, they, I didn't do it because I, I never wrote letters. Yeah. And so I went in and got chewed out by the chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the thing I remember doing about boot camp. And let's see, then I, uh, 
Uh, that's basically all I can recall about. Oh no, I had one other incident. We were all in our barracks in the middle of the night and uh, uh, there was a Marine uh, prison camp close by uh, where the Marines would get in trouble. I guess they had, a, I don't know what it was, it was about. I didn't see it, the actual camp, but uh, some say, uh, so a Marine got a, walked down uh, the, off of the, uh, his guard post with a loaded gun and came running through our barracks looking for some reason, for some, went through the barracks and all the sailors were getting out of the doors and windows and getting out of the, out of the barracks. And we got, out, all of us got out on the street and here he come this guy, a sailor, this Marine with holding the gun on two soldiers, as tailors that he'd found, he, he, rest, he was taken, I don't know where he was taking them. Jeez. And he was walking them down the street and all I looked around, here came this Marine, looked like a colonel or major, walked up to him and took his gun away from him. And first thing you know, the, this Marine was walking passively away to wherever they went. Good <laughs> and that was a, But it, we were scared the devil out of us all. <laughs> we didn't know what was going on. That's the one thing I recall about boot camp. That's about it on the boot camp part. Uh -huh. I went to home to, on Liberty uh, two weeks later, I think it was. And then went uh, on the uh, train all the way across the country to uh, San Francisco, or I believe it was. Or, yeah, I was, went on Liberty in San Francisco one night, one day. And then we, I don't recall where we left from, but I think it was Oakland, I'm not sure oh, yeah. at, at that time, and uh, it was a board, we boarded a, a troop ship, the USS Hampton, and uh, I was on that, and there were, I think there was uh, 11 troop uh, ships in the convoy we were on, headed overseas, got off of uh, Pearl Harbor, about 100 miles, we were off Pearl Harbor. Uh, about a hundred miles from Pearl, and uh, the uh, captain came all board on on the microphone uh, on the uh, on the micro radio or whatever it was, and and loudspeaker was the word I was trying to seek. He uh, announced that war uh, the Japanese had surrendered. And, really? And we were about a hundred miles off this uh, Pearl, and when, then we went on into. Uh, Manila Bay, and uh, I uh, we went on Liberty. I think it was uh, no, we stopped in yeah Liberty Bay and uh, went on Liberty in Manila one night, and then they took us on over to Tubaba Island, right off the tip of Samar in the Philippines, and there I was for I was uh, I was scared to death that there was a, right close to t t Tubaba Island the they drug two cement uh, dry docks all the way across the Pacific to this place. And there's a lot of the so uh, sailors that are, were on our ship got detailed to the dry dock. I didn't want to do that. I didn't <laughs> want any part of that, but luckily I didn't. So I got to be ship's company on Tuba Bay Island. And the only thing I really remember, oh, I got two or three incidents that uh, I could tell you about uh, while I was there. Uh, I got, it rained all the time in this little island, all the time. And I got jungle rot. I don't know if you know what jungle rot is, but it is awful. Uh. And I would, it was about a half a mile down to the first aid station. So I'd walk down to the first aid station and the medic would paint me up and I'd walk back. And by the time I got back to the barracks, uh, I was wanting to go back to the <laughs> first aid station. <laughs> and uh, so I did that two or three times and it was quite a walk. And when I got, I, I got tired, I said, why don't you just give me that medicine and let me do it? And he said, okay, handed it to me. And I went back to the barracks and sat down and took my clothes all off, sat down and painted myself. And the first thing I just yelled out screaming and hollering and I started crying, stood up hollering, shaking, and I run outdoors and sit down in the mud and pull the mud and rain. Uh, it was raining like mad and pulled the mud up in between my crotch area 
And, and it was, I've never had dry rot after that. It cured it, but I stayed in the sack for two days. <laughs> and uh, so that was one incident that happened to me there. And uh, another incident, uh, oh, our, our, bar our Quonset hut was right close to the road. And, that, and our outhouse was just a big old box sitting out there on the edge of the road with about three holes on each side. Mm -hmm. And you'd sit there on the roadside on this box doing your thing. Yeah. And then people were walking down the road. The <laughs> ladies come up, try to sell you trinkets. <laughs> While you're sitting there. <laughs> While you're sitting there. <laughs> and one, one thing I remember out, and uh, <laughs> let's see what else did happen. Well, it was, uh, oh, one day the, uh, the, well, I think I was there probably two and a half to three months. I really can't tell you exactly the dates, <clears throat> but um, they they announced that they were going to close the base, and that you could uh, uh, you could get, if you were a ship's company, you could go anywhere you want to in the Pacific. Instead of me, I saw this LST that was scheduled to go into the Guam. And I decided to put myself on that, which was a stupid thing. I could have put myself on a sh ship going to Japan or somewhere. Yeah, where, yeah. To, but I was so sick and tired of this island that I was ready to go anywhere, but, it, but yeah. I wanted to go home. Yeah. I guess I was homesick. Anyhow, I put myself on that ship to, uh, in Guam. Flew there to Guam, and when I was in uh, Guam, uh, they put me in the barracks for two or three days and uh, before the ship got in. And uh, as I put in, the, I was put in with an all black uh, person, uh, mm -hmm. men in yeah. this barracks. And I'd never, I was a young boy who grew up, but I didn't grow up around blacks. I yeah. didn't, nobody, there was no one, none in my hometown. Yeah. It was, uh, and uh, the only time I ever saw a black man was the train uh, conductor guy, I mean, uh, huh. Stewart got off and set the chair down on, I mean, the stand on the, yeah. so people get on and off the train. Huh. That's the only time I ever saw a black man. Huh. And here I am in the barracks with them, and they all, <laughs> well, they were all fine and treated me great, even took my money on, on teaching me how to play craps. <laughs> 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 and uh, so that was the part of that. And the huh. first time I ever saw a homosexual was this huh. Marine, uh, was uh, playing ball with this other Marine that had a gun on his side. I was, to, I was, oh, that was during the time I was signed a job watching Japanese load uh, uh, off a truck, sugar bags, and putting them in a warehouse. Huh. I was a guard, and I couldn't, I yeah. didn't know Japanese. I couldn't even say hello to them. <laughs> now, were these prisoners of war? Yeah, they were prisoners okay. of war. And they were unloading this truck, and I was supposed to watch him. Huh. And that was my one job. But anyhow, at the same time, this guy was playing baseball, uh, throwing the ball back and forth. <laughs> and uh, later on, I got back to the barracks. I asked one of those black men, what's a homosexual? <laughs> <laughs> See, I was a country boy. I was really country. I had I no exposure what, to that Never in been around and heard. I <laughs> haven't heard that word before. How about that? And uh, <laughs> so that was one incident. I don't know if that was appropriate to talk about or not. No, that, that's interesting. I mean, this is a study of history, and that's yeah. very interesting. Anyhow, that was it. And then uh, I went reported to the LST, and uh, we went to, I think it was Tinian first, or was it Saipan? No, Saipan. And picked up stuff uh, from t Saipan, and we shuttled it to Tian, Tian, uh, Tinian. The island of Tinian, yeah, and uh, from Saipan to Tinian, and then they dumped that stuff in the ocean. I don't know. Huh. Uh, they drove it off of our ship, but took it out. And I think they drove it off and put it in the ocean. Huh. And we did that several times, shuttling back and forth. Yeah. And then we got orders to report to Pearl. So uh, we started. Uh, we after probably several weeks of, of being shuttling back and forth. 
we went, we headed for Pearl, and uh, I was assigned uh, deckhand. And as a deckhand, you chip decks or paint or or, or w clean the decks or whatever you do. Uh. And I don't take the sun well anymore, or didn't during that period. And I got sick a couple of days, and I, and uh, the exec said to me, well, why, "Why don't you go down and work in the galley? Get out of the, keep out of the sun." So I went down. And I about a week out. We were about a week out of uh, the Pearl, or uh, several days out of Pearl, and uh, the uh, he said to me. Why don't you uh, go to there? And I did. I was peeling potatoes, and when we pearled in the, then a few days, about less than a week, we pulled into Pearl Harbor. And I'd only peel potatoes for four or five days, and every now and then the cook say, "Would you turn that piece of meat for me on the uh, skillet? Uh. I mean, on the stove?" And so I was just turned 18, and uh, I never learned anything about cooking or anything like that in my life. Anyhow. I got uh, into Pearl, everybody went on duty, and a lot of the men on the ship had uh, seniority. I'd been there for a hundred years or so, a long, yeah. long time. Yeah. And a lot of them just went on home from there, and they got discharged. And the uh, captain came back on board. I couldn't go off ship because I didn't have any dress shoes for liberty. Oh. Mine were, got jungle rot and ruined, and, and so uh, I didn't even have a pair. And my paycheck hadn't caught up with me, <laughs> so uh, I st I was in the sitting in the kitchen peeling potatoes, and this captain came a blackboard and he come down and he says, "Is your name Jack L. Walters?" And I said, "Yes, sir." And uh, he said, "Well, I just got orders. I have to. to we got to go back to Saipan. We're not going to back to to, to the states. We're going to Saipan." And he said. I can't leave the harbor without a rated cook aboard. And he pointed at the stove and said, what's that? And I said, well, that's the stove. And he said, you just now made your third class rated. You're now the cook in charge of this galley. <laughs> and a couple hours later, we were steaming out of the harbor. <laughs> well, it's a lucky thing for me uh, that I didn't even know how to turn stove on it. <laughs> I would have probably figured it out, but anyhow, they had a baker on the ship, and he saved the day for me, and uh, he showed me the, the menu that I was supposed to follow. <laughs> so I was, I was cooking for seventy-six men in charge of that galley as, uh, as we, and, and so I, <laughs> I don't know how many weeks or just what. Well, I wasn't cooking very long, probably five or six weeks at the most I, uh, before we came back to, and went to the States and I got discharged. But that was a, one of the experiences on that ship that I recall. <laughs> and uh, Where were you when you heard that the A-bombs had been dropped on Japan? Uh, I, uh, I, it, it was probably in the States, okay. I, I, if I remember right. Uh, I think it was, yeah. Because you said they surrendered while you were in the Pacific. Yeah. Uh, they, and the only thing that was, uh, while they surrendered, while we, the only thing we was, we went on in, uh, in blackout was because one, one submarine hadn't they had been located yet. Oh. Uh, off a of truck island, I yeah. think it was, they thought it was. And we didn't, uh, uh, they, they, so we stayed under, Zigzagging and under uh, dark, uh, and blacked out all the way to the Philippines. Well, when you heard that the Japanese had surrendered and your your shipmates heard, was there some kind of celebration or what? you know? Uh, no, uh, you, you you mean on the ship? Yeah, I, right. I really don't honestly remember. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we were all happy and glad about it, and yeah. probably did do yeah. you know, uh, a lot of that kind of action, but I, I don't really recall okay. any uh, extreme excitement about yeah. it. I think we probably had heard that they were in the process of surrendering and and probably knew that already. Okay. But uh, I don't recall exactly what they did, what, what, how excited we were. I'm sure we were. That's about uh, 
And then I, when I got in there, uh, the uh, in the Oakland, I think we parked our, uh, we, we decommissioned our ship in Oakland, I believe it was. There was seven ships tied up there, and all LSTs, and uh, they had a floating uh, cafeteria. Guess who they put in charge of it? I was. You. I was me for about <laughs> I think I think it was less than a week, <laughs> but, and uh, that was it. And uh, I, first thing you know, I'm on a train to Norman, Oklahoma, for a discharge. Did you ever have any complaints about your cooking? Oh yeah, but uh, <laughs> none. Not, not too bad because uh, that's Baker saved my life. Yeah, he he really showed me how to clean a chicken and <laughs> cut them up and all that kind of stuff. And what was the morale like on your ship before, oh, it, before the Japanese surrender? Uh, the morale was good. Uh, it was high, and uh, uh, we uh, it was all business on this LST. The LST I was on had been a, a medical sh uh, LST. They took. A, uh, they had a lot of medics on it for a while. I wasn't on it, but at that time, but yeah. uh, that's what they did. It was a busy ship during the war. Yeah. So. Well, I assume you were very relieved when you heard that the Japanese had surrendered. Oh yeah, that was a that was a great relief. I, I, but I wanted to go to war. <laughs> I yeah. never did get it in yeah. any battle. Never seen any action. So. Yeah. That was basically, you know, I was a young kid and ready to go to war and be a hero. Yeah. And that didn't work out for me very well. Now you brought pictures of your two ships, I believe. I yes, know you I brought did. one of your LSD. Did you show a, those? I have a picture of the USS Hampton, the was the uh, is the ship that I went overseas on. It's a freighter. And uh that's uh there was a uh, seven other ships. I mean, eleven other ships. Uh, ten other ships. We were eleven. Eleven ships in that convoy, and it was just like that. Eleven other ships, about like that. Is that it? Yeah, that looked that looked good. And now, then, when, you, when you went over, were, were you in a convoy with all those other ships? Then? Uh -huh. So the, the eleven ships in yeah. the convoy. Okay. Yeah, we were all separated, of course, but we right. were in an eleven okay. ship convoy. Okay. I thought we were, I believe that they really intended to be, a, I think Harry Truman probably saved my life. I'm not sure, of course, yeah. I have no way of knowing yeah. that he probably saved my life when he dropped the bombs yeah. on Japan because I think we were part of that million man fodder that they were going to sacrifice on the beaches of, yeah. if they invaded Japan. Yeah. That's just my personal opinion, yeah. but I, I have no way of knowing that, of course. Good chance that you're correct about that. Yeah. And uh, this is the picture of the LST that I was aboard. Okay. And uh, it's LST 247. And uh, I was on there probably uh, no more than four months. And this here is a little map I have at, uh, of Tubaba Island. And right here is uh, Samara right. and uh, the Bay of Leyte Bay Gulf right, right. there. And uh, Tubaba Island right in that area right here. Right. And uh, that's where I was stationed in the, in the island. And this is a picture of me as a All right. in my boot camp picture, yeah. and uh, kind of handsome, ain't it? Very handsome, <laughs> extremely handsome. Wish to look like that today. <laughs> I tell you, you look good today. Believe me. Thank you. That's uh, oh, uh, then I uh, I was back in high school playing football before I was 19 years of age. I went back and uh, my. Sophomore and junior year, year uh, and the, about my junior year, I decided to, I didn't want to go to school anymore. I went to and took the the test for getting your equal. Your I forget what they call that. Uh, it's the same as diploma for, okay. for yeah. getting a high school education. Yeah, and uh, I did that. During my earlier years, I forgot to mention when I was growing up, my dad was a telegraph operator. 
and he'd clean off the supper table in the evenings, and he'd put the, he had a little portable co uh, telegraph key, and he sent me, uh, taught me the Morse code, huh. and sent me. I had an ear for, for Morse code, and, and I learned. I was probably three or four years. Uh, he did that during my growing up period, and uh, by the time I went in the Navy, I thought I'd get out of boot camp, they'd send me to radio school. Yeah. Well, they didn't need any radio operators. <laughs> was, the war was grinding down and yeah. it was about over with, so they didn't, they didn't offer me anything. So wow. I, I, was, uh, I was doomed to be a sailor, <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that was a part of my life. And then. Uh, when I got out of the Navy and I went to, uh, uh, went back to my hometown, went to high school, and then graduated, uh, I mean got my diploma, I decided to go into railroad instead of going on to college. Big mistake, but I did it. And uh, I was a railroad telegraph operator uh, in my own hometown for a few weeks. And then I went to work in the Denver, Colorado, Western Railroad in Colorado and went up on an extra board and went from one town to another, working from as an operator up and down the road. Now that must have been interesting. Oh, to I see. did. I, it was during the time where you had bed and breakfasts, and I'd yeah. stay in one of bed and breakfast from one town and move on to another, uh -huh. uh, up and down the line. Uh, that's what they did. Uh, you, one time I pulled into a little town in Colorado. I can't recall the name of the town now. And I got off, I was wearing a, a summer suit, a seersucker suit. And uh, the seer, uh, the, when I got off the train, the, the, per, the operator I was relieving got on the train and he handed me the keys and took off and, I, and the train took off and I got off and I went down to a boarding house and checked into the board. He told me about the boarding house. So I went down to the boarding house and uh, then uh, the next day, I went went to open up the office, and there was about four or five guys standing there in their dress suits and already. And uh, they said, "Can we talk to you, sir?" And they, I said, uh, well, "What do you want to talk to me about?" I didn't know anybody there. He said, "Well, we're looking for a school teacher, and we saw you had when you got off the train. You're seersicker. You had, you was wearing a suit." And it, we thought anybody that wore a suit probably had a college education. How about and that? We just, we're, we're looking for, we need to teach a bed. Really? <laughs> How about that? Oh, it was during the times when the, those times were true. I mean, that was. Yeah. A, and uh, so uh, huh. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I just barely finished high school. <laughs> <laughs> but here I, so uh, that, that happened in that period of time. But uh, I worked there. I was engaged to my hometown sweetheart. And, I wanted to go back to Kansas, so I went back to Yates, uh, Yates Center, Kansas, where I, where I grew up, and then I went to work for the Missouri Pacific Railroad in Oklahoma, and worked there for uh, eight years. And one day I was uh, working as a telegraph operator in Nova, Oklahoma, and uh, the uh, agent. Uh, I mean, I met a girl there and married, and we got married, and we had a couple, three children, and uh, one of them passed away, uh, died in birth. Anyhow, uh, we uh, uh, worked there, and then one day the, I got notice they're closing all down, all the operators on the railroad station, on the up and oh, down the entire yeah. line, fired us all. Or God. laid us all off. Yeah, they, uh, they modernized. They went to radio control. Yeah. They didn't need telegraph operators. So about what year was this? Approximately, oh, or see, what period? Of... Probably uh, sixty-two or okay. sixty-three period. I can't recall yeah. actually yeah. the actual dates of that. Uh, yeah. But it was early in the sixties, okay. and uh, so uh, laid us all off and. Uh, yeah. So I went to Wichita, went to work for Boeing Aircraft Company and worked for them for about seven, eight years. I had a, I was a U.S. An expediter, move, go all over the planet and uh, take the expedition. Uh, if uh, they needed an airplane part, I took it part 
and went and got the plans for it, the part that they needed, and uh. take, it, then take it to the shop and set a priority for the airplane uh, and for it, and, and that's what an expediter did. And uh, I was, I was, one day they offered me $2,000 uh, to uh, go to Castle Air Force Base on a spatial project they had going out on out there. And I, uh, I never had seen $2,000 before. <laughs> before. <laughs> so I went to, uh, I went out to uh, California, Merced, California, yeah. at the base out there. And my wife is a registered nurse, and she uh, she got a job there, and uh, we were we were even buying a uh, in the process of buying a house. But before I went into uh, uh, to uh, I mean uh, before I went to California, I, one day a friend wanted to go down to the civil service office, and uh, I had. Uh, he didn't have a car, so I took him down. And while I'm standing around waiting on him, I saw this uh, poster that said, "Wanted you, uh, President Nixon wanted to hire 700 customs officers. And so uh, I filled out the thing, and they called me in to take a test, and I took the test, and then forgot all about it. And we were living out in Merced, California, and just b made Purchased a, a, a VA house, uh, a veterans uh, used my veterans uh, to buy a house, and just in the process of getting ready to move in, I got this telegram, and so they let me back out of buying the house, huh. gave me my money back, and and uh, I was I accepted the job for U.S. Customs, and uh, I went out to California, San Diego, and. and Worked for 25 years for the U.S. Wow. Customs Service out there, and uh, I had uh, did that. And, uh, and the last job I had on, uh, they flew me out to the down to Monterey, Mexico. I flew out, and when I went aboard the USS Independence, and they helicoptered me all over the different ships uh, in the fleet. Wow. As, and I cleared all the ships coming into, as we rode into San Diego. And you know, I used to go out on, uh, on a helicopter and land in the fog. They'd land me on a ship. I never understood how they could do that, yeah. but they did, uh, all the time in in San Diego. And uh, it was a, and as a, that's what I did, uh, as customs officer. And then I worked down at San Ysidro with the people coming in and out of the border. Uh, Busiest land port, border yeah. port in the world. Uh, about 80 million people a year go across that border, yeah. and uh, I got some big bust. I made some big yeah, bust, uh, narcotic bust on yeah. several people. Uh, I arrested a lot of folks during that 25 years. Well, that must have been an interesting job. It was one of the most interesting jobs I ever had, and I hated to leave, but. Uh, it's a nerve-wracking job, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but it, uh, when I put my when I got my 30 years all in, why, yeah. including my Navy time and yeah. everything else, where I uh, I gave her up and yeah. moved here. My daughter had married a young man here, and and they'd moved uh, in Texas. They'd moved, and then they moved here to Georgia, and uh, they had the youngest of uh, well, I had. Three girls and the, and uh, the three girls they he had, they uh, my daughter that lived here had the youngest so okay. we decided to move here. Good. So that's what brings me here. Wow. And uh, I'm glad to relate anything else you want to know, but that's about all I can think of to say. Oh boy, you've had a fascinating life. Uh, thank you, sir. You've been all over and you've I've done, done a lot, lot of, of interesting things. I've done a lot of things. Now you're also an author. I understand. Oh yes, I did. I wrote a book. I'm. I've, I've actually I've wrote two books. One is the the life of my father, which is I'm presently finished. But my my uh, wife is my editor. She's about okay. half edited. Okay. She got about half of it edited. And I just wrote this book, The Sailor. Okay. And it's a it's a you know, about a it's a story about a young man uh, who was 15 and he was put into the British Navy by. By hook and crook, they where they went in and grabbed him off the streets, 
Huh. Yeah, and you're in the Navy now. Is that a fiction or not? No, uh, that's a factual fact. So but uh, a lot of my books about the war in 1812 and, yeah. uh, and uh, the the Barbary pirates. Yeah. And that's all factual. Yeah. But it's a, I wrote it in a f fictional manner. Yeah. Put my hero in the middle of all of it. Yeah. And uh, so that's basically what it's about. Uh, it's mostly all over the Mediterranean. Wow. So a lot of a lot of adventurous stories about different things in the, in the so, but basically it's the story about the Barbary pirates is actually true. Well, you're a man of many talents. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, my uh, new story is about hoboing during the huh. uh, during the depression. My dad was uh, before he settled down in his life was he'd. Uh, hoboed around the country a little bit and then he went in and got involved and he was in the earthquake in uh, San Francisco Jesus. which uh, I've got him in and that's a fact and then he went down and uh, three or four after years later in 1911 got involved in the revolution down in Mexico good gosh and uh, <laughs> he got uh, he after he finished that he, he went back to Kansas and got married to my mother and uh, had a little girl, and then got drafted into World War One, but he didn't get over to uh, the, he didn't get over to Germany. I mean, to fight in the war, but he was in the flu epidemic in in that ter oh, period, yeah. and he was a nurse's aide there. And, and uh, boy, uh, I, I didn't use him as a telegraph. I don't know. I don't know why. But anyhow. Uh, he was a nurse's aide there and during the flu epidemic, and uh, and uh, but I got him overseas in my novel, yeah. over fighting in yeah. World War One and the and the field there. Anyhow, well, you're fortunate he shared those stories with you. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, that's about it as far as I can think of. Uh -huh. Anything to tell you about uh, my life when we moved here to uh, Georgia? My wife and I. Uh, she was a my wife was a registered nurse, and she became. Uh, she was a, uh, uh, and when we moved to San Diego, uh, we lived in Chula Vista. And in Chula Vista, they, well, uh, she got on the midnight shift, uh, and she was there about three weeks, and the nursing administrator called her in one day and said to her, I've got to go, I'm sick, i got to go to the hospital, and I'll be out for several months, and I want you to take my place. I don't know why she picked my wife, but she did, and, uh, and she never came back. My wife was the nursing administrator of the, the hospital. Uh, the uh, I suppose you might have heard of the Scripps Hospital System yeah, yeah. in uh, San Diego. Wow. Well, uh, she was part of that hospital association, and we had uh, a lot of benefits from being there. We had a lot of trips and stuff, and being uh, for the. Oh, the hospital, we'd go on uh, parties and stuff. Uh, uh, I remember one party we went on where they flew in the uh, the uh, what the head Catholic uh, priest from the, of the Archbishop of, of oh, Manila. Really? Uh, yeah, they sell at one of the weddings and stuff like that. Huh. Uh, we had an interesting life all together. Yeah. And she was the head of office, and she made good money. I made good money. We had a good. We've always had a good life. Well, it sure sounds like it. Yeah. About all I can think of to tell you. <laughs> Would y'all have any questions? Either one of you, Tony? You, you have any questions? Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you sharing this with us, and I want to give you just a one more chance. If there's anything you want to say before we finish, I will tell you about my, one other thing that just popped into my mind that I almost forgot. Uh, when they on our LST, we only we didn't have a lot of guns, but we still had uh, gun assignments, yeah. you know, and we had this uh, pom pom anti aircraft gun. I think it was a 40 millimeter. Uh -huh. I think that's what it was. And uh, well, uh, they put me on there as a loader. And the first time that gun went off, I peed my pants, <laughs> went down on my knees, and cried. I, and my ears just couldn't stand that shell. I don't know what I would have done in war, a real war. <laughs> <but> <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that's a good story to end it on. That's, 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 that's good. <laughs> well, seriously, we are really thankful that we were had the opportunity to hear your story, and a lot of other people are going to have an opportunity, too. And I want to thank you for your service, not only in the military, but in the Customs Service. Oh. That, that was very critical to our our country doing that. It's, it's, I joined the Navy Reserve uh, in, when I lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I was there for a few weeks, a few months, and they sent me to, I went on a trip, uh, on a reserve trip to Cuba. Huh. And uh, while we were in Cuba, some helicopter uh, off of another ship and went down to sea, and they sent us out searching for that. And uh, that's about my only connection. I I didn't stay in the reserves very long yeah. because uh, it was difficult to get back and forth from Los Alamos, New Mexico, yeah. where I lived with the Atomic Energy Commission yeah. when I worked for them. Did I tell you about that? No. Uh -uh. I don't know. I lost I lost continuity there. When uh, I was in Castle Air Force Base, I got the job working for the Atomic Energy Commission in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Huh. And uh, I moved my family there. Uh, this was before we got this yeah. into customs. I, I completely forgot about that phase. And uh, we were in Los Alamos, moved there, and lived in the barracks. Uh, Condo, we lived in condo units that was right behind where they worked on the atomic bomb for the first building. Uh, we were in front of it, and wow. that, that was back in back of us. And uh, we lived in, that was a great place to live. I raised my ch kids there for eight, eight, eight years or wow. eight or nine years. We were in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And uh, it was a boys, uh, a, Los Alamos had been a boys' camp for wealthy children. That's what before they developed it into the atomic energy. Yeah. And uh, it was a it was a uh, hidden city there for a long time. But I didn't get there until they the fence uh, it opened the gates and yeah. stuff. But uh, prior to that, it was a closed city. You couldn't get into it. Wow. But I was in security there, and I'd go around from and work, uh, drive all over the place and uh, and go to a, a station. And they had a lot of, uh, there's, uh, Los Alamos is on a mesa and they had uh, several laboratories on these individual mesas. And you'd go out to the mesa and sometimes the mesas were two or three miles into the, uh, deep into the mesa. And you'd have to drive quiet, and you'd see uh, yeah. animals and wild yeah. animals and stuff. And uh, but it was all guarded, and you couldn't. You know, and I was part of the guarding system, and uh, nothing really ever happened except uh, my kids all got a great education. Yeah. And uh, there, and because most of the te everybody was PhD there, wow. was, except me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you were probably the smartest one there probably. with your experiences. <laughs> well, there's some strange people there, I tell you. I used to walk through the laboratories at night, and my one of my jobs was to uh, look for security violations. And uh, and when I uh, uh, they leave a secret secret document out on the on their desk or some oh, yeah. some PhD scientist yeah. would leave a secret. <laughs> document on the desk. I was supposed to write him up and get him in trouble. And uh, then uh, they, they'd, I'd always check the safe to see if it was locked. That the, They had a, a safe to put it, uh, their documents in and they're supposed to lock it up. And I'd always have to check the day and that was part of my job. And then I'd go, they'd have, every one of them would have uh, uh, formulas written on the on their wall board that they'd work in and were working on these formulas for different reasons. And I'd try to find out if they'd secretly put in their, the combination of the safe <laughs> in, their, in their formulas. And one or two of them did. And uh, I'd catch them, you, you'd report that to them and they'd get them in trouble. Yeah. And uh, that was, you know, they had a memory problem <laughs> trying, to, trying to get away from it. But that was, it and then one day I got notified 
I'd put in for the Tusk Customs Service after about eight years with the Atomic Energy Commission and they got notified to report to duty in, New, in uh, San Diego, got the job I wanted and good. had a good life, made good money, had a good time. Well, I can't think of a better way to finish this than you saying that because you have had a fascinating life and are still having a fascinating <laughs> life. And thank you so much for coming in here and sharing it, the experiences with us. My and thank you for sir. your service. And my privilege. Okay.